What's going on, my good people, my center folks out there in the world of movies? We love you. We miss you. This is your boy Jay Alonzo. Welcome back to Back to the Classics, the cinematic movie podcast that takes you back to the iconic films of 20 years ago, right here on iHeartRadio. What's going on? And um, we decided to do a, a switch it up a little bit. It is Black History Month, and uh, what better way to celebrate Black History Month than have uh, a gentleman who is making his own stamp on Black History itself, celebrating the self motivation. He's celebrating what it means to be your own boss, to have your own voice. It is an honor and a pleasure to have this man on the show today with a very in depth conversation. Y'all make some noise. Welcome to the DeLorean. Uh, award-winning marketer, instructor, and multimedia journalist. My guy, make some noise for Julian Mitchell. What's going on, bro? What up, what up, Ju, man? Feels good to be on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming through, man. It's been a long time coming, man. I remember uh, you were one of the first yeah. people I wanted on the show when I first started the show. Wow, I didn't even know that. I, didn't, I, I do remember uh, us going back and forth a while back when you were starting and then it being something that we would revisit every now and then. So it's good to make it work, come full circle. Oh yeah, man. Especially, especially with you, with you and what you got going on, you know, whenever, whenever the time was right to make it happen, we were going to make it happen because you, my brother are doing stuff that's beyond my pay grade, <laughs> but, <laughs> I, but I, but I know for a fact that, but, but you are holding it down for, for the culture and, 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 and what we're trying to do. And I, and I feel like the best way to get you on the head, to get your voice heard, uh, what better episode than the one we're doing today. So, but with that being said, uh, a mm-hmm. thousand, a thousand thank yous and a thousand congratulations to you about what you got going on. So let's get thank into you. it, man. You did the, uh, the, uh, the relay, the relay torch in uh, in Seoul, Korea, for the Winter Olympics, correct? Yes, yeah, huh. incredible experience. It was the uh, Olympic torch relay, and how was that for, for you for the Winter Games? Surreal. It was surreal. It was uh, incredible going out there, being in Korea, <clears throat> um, seeing the the atmosphere. You grow up watching Olympic games, and we all can remember you know, the re- the summer games and seeing Ali and people carry the torch and. Right. Just just the ceremony and the prestige and the history and the, the, the meaning behind, you know, the torch relay is just symbolic of legacy. You know, you talk about legacy a lot and all of that. So right. being right. out there and seeing that and experiencing it and being in Korea and knowing and learning about the history of Korea and how big um, it is for the, the games to be held there and you know, going to ceremonies and seeing the history of all the torches that have been carried, you know, since the 90s and the Olympic and Summer Games and, you know, and just holding the torch and carrying it and just thinking about everything, you know, I've been through and experienced to this point and uh, what motivates me and what and what drives me to keep going. And, you know, it, it was it was incredible individually, you know, and then there's things like, with my son and, you know, bring, being able to take the torch back uh, to the States and have that piece of history and have those things that, you know, he can be proud of and he knows about as he gets older. And it just adds to, um, you know, it just adds to that. It just adds another element to the the generations uh, passing down, which is a really good feeling. So it was great. It was surreal. It got, it got realer and realer. Uh, as I was there seeing more and experiencing more and hearing more people's stories. So it, it was a great experience. I could definitely tell you um, when, when I saw you uh, on TV uh, lighting the torch, you look cold, brother. You look, ex- <laughs> <laughs> you look extremely cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what? It wasn't as cold. So they were telling us it was going to basically be freezing. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had everybody has to wear an official, you know, they have the, the outfit. So we had to wear an official uh, outfit, um, which was we had a beanie, the mitts, uh, the under like a, the thermal undercoat right, the right. jacket mm-hmm. and all of that. So we were really warm. Shout out to the North Face. They always make incredibly warm uh, outerwear. We were really really warm but it wasn't as cold as they thought it got colder 
uh, later in the day. But when we were actually carrying the torch, it wasn't as bad uh, as they were telling us. But we were definitely prepared. Definitely prepared. Word. For so, so I, I wanted to uh, get into a few things with you. Um, I've been yep. I've been trying to get into your brain and to, to, and to see how you got your start because um, uh-huh. you know you know for those who don't know me and Julian go back to high school. And so when we got out of high North school, Town, Northtown Mojave. Mojave represented, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh, to watch to watch Julian uh, branch out and to see, you know, to watch him do what he does. You know, back in 2013, you used to work under Diddy for Revolt, which was something that blew my mind. But then um, um, as time progressed, you started doing the, uh, the you started crafting content for uh, Beast by Dre. Uh, I believe you did something for Honda, Wells Fargo, uh, Magic Johnson Enterprises, and all that. And that's and that's a beautiful thing to me. So now you have your uh, Get Paid to Be Yourself series, which I'm right. really excited to hear about. Um, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and break that down to uh, to the center folks? Yeah, so Get Paid to Be Yourself started as a series about three years ago. Um, so, so even to backtrack, so I've been a Forbes columnist, um, I've been contributing to Forbes for, uh, going on three years this March. And, um, when I started, I really wanted to translate that relationship between culture and commerce and give the new creative class, people like you and I, you know, who are just in this generation hustling, um, with a multitude of talents and vision who want to design the careers they want, you know, defy tradition, do things that are really about changing the narrative, shifting the paradigm, you know, redesigning industry. So um, when I came in, Get Paid to Be Yourself started as an editorial series where I would profile creators, entrepreneurs who built multifaceted businesses that are all rooted in who they are and their story and, you know, what they were passionate about. So the whole idea of getting paid to be yourself was designing the career or building the businesses you want or navigating industries the way that you want, all being true to yourself without losing yourself, without feeling like you have to fit into something or fit all of your passions into one job or one space. Right. Um, So I started profiling people who did that. So he started out with Ernest Baker, Marcus Troy, uh, Frendy Lamorin, um, and then grew that into Mondo Fresco, who, you know, we'll be having a live talk with Rob Stone and John Cohen of the Fader, Andy Martinez, uh, Candy, just a, bu- a bunch of people. And then that expanded into, um, and this is them talking about their business model, their guiding principles, and what got them to the place of, of having the careers that they have. Um, and each one, I would always open it with what I would consider a lesson or a teachable moment for anybody reading it. So I would give you the lesson and then give you their story and then you can apply it to you know, your own path. And then from there, um, it expanded into uh, workshops where I've gone, you know, around the country uh, and, you know, at festivals, at colleges and, um, you know, community organizations. And I'm teaching uh, young creators, entrepreneurs how to get paid to be themselves, you know, identifying your value, rethinking your relationship to your work, right. uh, turning your talents into turning multiple talents and the multiple streams of income, you know, turning your hobbies into professions, just, you know, teaching people what it's about. And then that evolved into also taking these conversations live. So traveling around the country um, and sitting one-on-one with these people I've profiled and people who represent this and, you know, getting a room of two to 300, you know, creators and entrepreneurs and, having the conversation live. Um, so that's what it's, what it's grown yeah. to today. I've seen that uh, you've had a, an incredible turnout from the uh, various times I've, I've caught it on, um, on social right. media. You've had a, a, mm-hmm. a hell of a turnout. So I, I think for me personally, and in, uh, and, and, and other people who are familiar with your work, what motivates Julian Mitchell? What, what motivates you? What motivates me is seeing 
a smarter culture. And when I say smarter, and I feel like that's my purpose. I feel like that's part of my mission, my assignment while I'm on this earth is making people culture smarter. And when I say that, smarter meaning more enlightened, right. more informed, and more inspired. Um, and liberating people to think for themselves and stay true to themselves and believe that they can really design and have the lives, the careers that they want to have. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big motivator for me, getting people um, like myself, you know, when I was coming up, nobody was telling me I could do the things that I'm doing now. Nobody was an example. Nobody was showing me. I got that through my imagination and what I you know, the the magazines that I read and the shows that I watched and, you know, the, the people that I stalked, you know, who who inspired me. So I feel like what drives me is also being the pe being one of the people I looked up to and knowing that I'm in a position to shape the next generation, this generation and the next generation, what they care about, how they move. Um, and ultimately uh, give them more examples, you know, of what's possible and what they can do and how they can do it and knowing that they don't have to sacrifice who they are, you know, to, to get there. So that, that those things really drive me for sure. Yeah, you know, I, I definitely feel the same because I was on um, my guy uh, Twice's show, uh, shout out to Twice and Oak, and uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to make clear was – with you know, with this podcast and what we do here at Beat Network, it wasn't something that we initially thought that you know from you know youth. This is what we, this is what we were gonna do. You know, you know me. Right. I went to L.A. to be an actor. I wanted to, I wanted to act. I wanted to be in movies. I wanted to do, do the whole thing. But along the way, I've learned that you know, just sitting here with a microphone and be and be able to to talk about what I enjoy most, which is films and filmmaking and, and, and the industry as a whole, mm -hmm. I can take that, that, that hobby and make it to a career. And, you know, now as, as we sit here, we're now on iHeartRadio and we're able to get, you know, other content creators like yourself to, you know, jump on with us and just, we, you know, we're in demand right now. I feel like we are, we are in high demand as far as brand new talent, creating brand new content that we don't slow down. We just keep going. We just, we keep going. So I, yep. I, I feel you hundred percent when you say that. Yeah. And you know, it's funny you say that. I, one thing I always tell people is the difference between a hobby and a profession is consistency and consistently getting paid for what you do. It's the, it's the only real difference. So, you know, we underestimate the power and the impact of our perspective and our voices and the talents that we do. Like Will Smith said, uh, you know, in an interview way back, somebody, you know, asked, how do you know what you should be doing? And he said, I look at it simply as take the things you do most naturally that impact the most amount of people. Right. And that's how you know what you should be doing. So, like, for you saying, you know what, I really know film because I grew up as a, you know, a cinephile, as they say, like, grew up loving movies and theater. And you know the history and the players and who shaped it. And, you know, that's a part of who you are. That got that that probably fuels your passion to be an actor. What made you want to move to L.A.? There's probably a part of that from you growing up watching movies. And now that's something you do naturally. You would sit on your couch and talk to your homies about films, whether you was on a microphone or not. You right, know what I'm saying? Right. So now you're able to create a structure around it being a podcast where there's just consistency and a platform to take those conversations to new levels and reach more people and grow and expand. But it really started with the simple idea of I'm somebody who loves movies. This is what I like to do. I would do this in my living room. And, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about you know it. What I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And, it, but, but there's like, like Jay-Z said about rapping, like if you watch some of his older interview, 
he used to tell people to stop telling him to rap and that it sounded stupid because it was too easy for him. Right. It, it was something that he felt like he didn't have to work to be good at, but he didn't realize that all those times he was grew up beating on the table and writing in his notebook and all that, that that was work he was doing. That was him perfecting the craft that is now easy for him because he naturally was doing the work and didn't even realize it, you know? So those are things that I think as a generation now, especially with all the resources and platforms available and all of that, like do what you love for real though. Like absolutely what you love and, and turn that into what you do, turn who you are into what you do for a living. Absolutely. So we, uh, we're here, we're celebrating black history month. And like I said, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jay Mitch, as we call him, <laughs> yep. he's his own part of, uh, of uh, creating his own part of black history. And for that, we, we definitely salute him for that today. That is an honor. Absolutely, sir. We are we, today. We're talking about the uh, the history of black filmmakers in the industry, mm-hmm. uh, past and present. And so I, it, I thought it was a very good topic for us to discuss today because of uh, where we are as far as the um, um, now getting the recognition for our uh, our black filmmakers to now instead of you know a black filmmaker directing a black film we now have black filmmakers taking marvel movies you know 160 million dollar budget films and making them right. bigger than what they ever could have been the the reviews out of black panther right now is something that nobody saw coming we knew we yeah. knew we knew it would be big. We knew it, we, I was going to say I I knew that was out the park. Oh yeah, we knew, you know, with Ryan Coogler, we knew it was going to be big regardless. I don't I didn't I didn't think the industry and I didn't think your primary moviegoer didn't expect it to be this big. And now we're in a position to where Black Panther is going to very well be the biggest movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, and which you got to put that in perspective and think about the zeitgeist of Marvel classics. And for you to put Black Panther, legitimately insert Black Panther into a conversation cinematically, right? Right. Because once you have the, the comics and people who grew up, you know, reading comic books, but we're talking about theater, the box office. This is where young kids are lining up and excited to go watch the movies even before they may even be able to pick up a comic book and see these heroes, you know, that they just literally don't see. Batman doesn't look like Black Panther. Spider-Man doesn't look like Black Panther. Not at all. None of these movies have, I can't like, I, the closest thing I'm, I'm going to be real about this. The closest thing I've seen, in my life to this point, like Black Panther was watching Shaka Zulu as a kid. Right. The movie Zulu. I saw that movie. That movie changed my, that blew my mind seeing that as a kid. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Seeing Shaka Zulu. And that was the first time knowing about just the Zulu tribe and seeing the shields and the weapons and just the excellence. We talk about black excellence, seeing just the power of an empire and a black ruler. And it was just, real and raw and i'm a kid i'm not even a teenager i'm a kid i remember just being blown away and since then and that movie came on cable television like since since then i can't remember the last movie in that same vein that i saw that was that unapologetically like black Mm -hmm. and and African at that. <laughs> oh, right. I just American. But all that to say is like, I think you're right. And I think it's important. And I think we have to keep it in perspective, not just by the, the numbers, because that's, of course, how we qualify things, what it does at the box office. Right. This is way, 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 way more important than that. It is. It, it, you know, to me, especially for. For Black Panther, you know, um, yours is Shaka Zulu. For me, mine's a bit more modern. Uh, the first time I really experienced an actual uh, black face, uh, an African-American man 
uh, us being represented outside of the norm of how we're normally represented in in uh, in cinema was, you know, of course, you know, we had Robert Townsend as Meteor Man, which was great. Uh, we, uh, had, we had a uh, 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 Damon Wayans with Blank Man, which was which, which was I awesome. Love you know, I it's, love Blank. it's a great movie. <laughs> But you know, it was for me. It was West, seeing Wesley as Blade for the first mm-hmm. time. It was okay. the best way to describe it was watching Wesley Snipes full Blade armor, and he and he just kicked so much ass, and it was like, yeah, that's what we need. You know what I mean? But ever since then, it's been a lack of it. So when when they present to us something like this, now it's like okay, so we now have the opportunity to showcase to our young, you know, our young black youth something sh- show themselves on a screen that's bigger than playing, you know, mm-hmm. the prisoner or playing the gangbanger or playing the crackhead or playing the, the ghetto bird or whatever, whatever the case may be. Yeah, because in, in I'll say this in the context of Black History, right? Black History Month. I think one of the great things about seeing a Black Panther from behind the scenes and in front of the camera, what you see and the people behind it is we usually only get the history that, and let me, and and let me be clear about this. We only get the history that uh, tells us about, you know, our past, but not necessarily always the history that's inspiring our future. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, Black Panther is very Afro futuristic. Absolutely. And I think, you know, even when we talk about Blank Man and even Blade is like Blank Man, most of those were comedies. Like like you're not taking it seriously. Blade is, you know, like this it's it's futuristic in terms of, you know, it being set kind of in the future and Wesley Snipes is this futuristic superhero vampire, you know what I'm saying? But it's still not something where you where it feels kind of real and tangible and and cultural at that collectively. Black Panther is like this is about the future. Like this is something that'll give you the past, like will show you history in a way that will inspire you to think about and imagine the future and Mm -hmm. i don't know if we really get that in our history of films like we have specials and if you're you know if you go to school and are are taught or you know all these and and you do your history you do your research you'll find history that inspires you undoubtedly right but we look at movies and, and things like this it's usually like what they talk about right it's either the the gangster movie, mm-hmm. the slave movie, mm-hmm. the biopic, you know, the biopic about said prominent legendary figure. Um, but it's not anything like what we're seeing now, where it's like, yo, this is about it, it, that that'll give you that that jolt of pride, you know, like that jolt of pride, that jolt of like, yo. It, it's it's really disruptive and futuristic to be black. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel the exact same way. And and even with the you know the slave movies, the, the the biopics and whatnot, with Black Panther being being set up the way it is to be a a Marvel movie uh, produced by Marvel, giving the reins to a black filmmaker. I feel like we're we're in, a, we're in a position now to where black is in such demand. For example, nobody nobody thought that F. Gary Gray, when he did Straight Outta Compton, that that movie would cross a hundred million dollars worldwide. We, we 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 didn't see it coming. We knew it would happen, but but the masses they wouldn't they they couldn't accept the fact that this was going to happen. You know, or or better yet, when we see uh, Ava DuVernay direct Selma and now she's doing uh, A Wrinkle in Time with uh, with Oprah and they're now throwing these 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 black directors, black filmmakers big budget projects to do to put their own voice to put their own stamp on it. So so going back to what we said earlier how we we're, we're much more in demand now than we've ever been. You know what's funny is I don't think we're more I think we've always been this in demand. I just think that the 
industry is busted wide open. Like you would think like social media to where we're, you just see us way. We've always been this much in demand. Right. Like, that's how hip hop was even able to evolve. That's how culture evolved to this point. Pop culture, the NBA, the NFL, the, uh, you know, just creativity in this country and across the globe. We've accelerated all of that. We build it. We created all of that. I think I think the I think something to think about to what you said is like when you say we always knew, but the math didn't. Right. Right. I think collectively we have to separate the the masses versus tax bracket and access because the we are the masses too you know like we are people with tremendous presence and influence and purchasing power and say so really about what's cool, what people should do, all those things. So in my mind, it's like we are the masses. Um, I think where we're at the disadvantage or the disconnect is like, it's about people with bigger tax brackets make more decisions. Right. Like if they tell you what's going to get played, what's going to get showed and where people who own things. And unfortunately, those people don't look like us. So even if we're in demand, if the people at the top don't cut the check or don't provide access, then, you know, or cut off of uh, the resources or the way to access resources to do more, then you, have, then you have a problem. Then on the other side of it is the people who are going to be able to go to the tours, like we'll look at music, the people who are able to afford to go to tours and buy people's merchandise and do all these different things and make some of these artists huge. Like a lot of times you go to rap shows and the audience doesn't look like us. A lot of times <laughs> right. more but often, than, more often than usual for sure. But that doesn't necessarily mean there's more white rap fans than black than non, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean there's more non black rap fans than white fans you just see more at a concert so i think your point of now giving the ryan Cooglers and people the green light and seeing people like charles king right who's killing it who owns macro and everything he's doing in the film in in, in hollywood that is i think where you start to see the the real shift that we're talking about more ownership more decision makers and more green lights and then everything that we see as people who know the culture and how things move, that's when you'll start to see that ripple effect, like boom. So let me ask you this. Um, We're now in in a, in a, in a place where we're seeing a lot of reboots. We're seeing a lot of um, uh, sequels and stuff, whatnot. Um, Even to the point to where Hollywood is now yearning for a uh, super fly reboot. Um, we're getting a, a Shaft sequel with, you know, with, with Sam Jackson. I believe Richard Roundtree, he's going to come back, uh, but it's going to be, you know, the, the son of Shaft. So are we now at the place to where we're going to take these older uh, black exploitation films? I even read somewhere that they was interested in doing a, a Foxy Brown and a Sheba Baby reboot as well. So do you believe where we are now? I, I, and, I, and I don't want to say it'll be the success of Black Panther, but where we are now as far as our creativity. And, and like you said, we've, we've always been in demand, but now we're so much more in the forefront. Are we, are we in a place now to where we can see these older black exploitation films or just, or just older films like sweet, sweet back, uh, badass song or, or films like that, get a, a, a touch up and redone and, and, and brought back to the masses. Yeah, I think, I think absolutely culturally, we always have celebrated the classics. That's why we'll sit there and watch Foxy Brown and, you know, Dolomite and all Hell up in Harlem, Bucktown. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. We'll watch Sugar Hill. We'll watch all these classics. Like, we'll sit up and watch those reruns all day long, you know, because 
culturally we we love them and we celebrate them. So I think if they're if they're done right and the right people are creating these films because you know that's a big con- you know this like that's a big conflict too is who's making the film exactly mm-hmm. stories so as long as you get people who you know can capture the essence of why we fell in love with these films uh then i think we would love it and it would be successful and those movies would go crazy you know we we're forced to watch uh remakes and you know all of that of movies we don't care about all the time. They come, they come to the box office all the time. So, yeah, they they come and go just as quick though. They they really do come and go. They do come and go. Um, so I think, I think for, for those types of films, yeah, there's an audience. They would, they would do well. And I think people would love to start to see the films that we loved, uh, culturally coming up, revisited, you know, on the big, again i think so yeah uh i feel the same way i know the uh the shaft uh sequel or, or the son of shaft i am looking forward to that one i thought the uh john singleton um his film with sam jackson was was brilliant like absolutely brilliant then you incorporate the original shaft himself richard roundtree and you put mm-hmm. the uh the original director gordon parks in the movie as well it's you know, it, it just it just breathed excellence to me you know what i mean so but with that being said though there's also films that should the they should they shouldn't be touched like new jack city i don't want a new jack city remake yeah, that, i don't need no, a yeah do. <laughs> well, no juice don't remake juice no sugar no. hill no <laughs> none of that nah those those are like those are like trophies in a case locked in a smithsonian somewhere you do not break the case no. Don't break the case. Leave it right there. Just, just leave it exactly where it's. Because you can't make the film better. No, you can't. And then in, even if you try to, uh, people like us who grew up with these films, they have these films uh, in a very special place in our hearts. We're immediately going to look at it like, okay, it was cool, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't match the original, you know. No classic that we got you know what i mean so that's like us wanted to have them uh you know completely scrap the the uh the final friday sequel that uh cubes been talking about for years and then let's let's reboot the entire friday franchise you can't do that no nah, that's like, like you can't reboot waiting to exhale you can't reboot paid in full you can't reboot like a lot of you can reboot certain movies like what you talked about with shaft and things like that because you can bring back certain iconic um, figures and they still contextually fit. You can have fun with it and make it make sense for this generation. Some of those other movies, like they only made sense with that cast at that time. Right. Telling story. It's like a time capsule. That's boom. Right. There's no real way to reimagine what that would be for this generation you know it's funny i, I had a conversation with, with a friend of mine and he said you know what i would love a, a, a reboot to the wood i'm like what nah 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 nah, nah, nah. the nah, wood <laughs> the wood is we, we talk about a time capsule that movie represents a time in our lives as youth to where even though it's it's set in the 80s and we're already like you know in the early 2000s when, when it came out but that movie represented us as young men growing up with your friends, growing up with your homeboys through middle school, through high school. And then once you guys get older and people go their own separate ways, it, 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 it for me, it taught me about the, the true meaning of friendship. You dig what I'm saying? Yeah. So to have to try to recreate that feeling again is almost, you know, no point. It's asinine at this point. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So, so even seeing we, we, when we go back to, um, to, uh, Black Panther, right? Mm-hmm. There's still in the name Black Panther so much history and symbolism in just making it Black Panther, the name. So, even with everything, 
knowing Black Panther and Googling Black Panther. If you're a kid and you watch Black Panther and you Google Black Panther and you see Huey Newton and Bunchy Carter and Angela Davis and Elaine Brown and this, that whole movement and everything, like that's a, that's a bridge to history that can connect, that can like, that can bridge the generation gap, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like very easily. Um, some of those movies we've talked about, it's like you can remake them, but you have to remake them years from now. Like you, li- you, you literally have to remake them when we are much older and we can appreciate it. And then you add the nuances in it that give us that nostalgia and remind us and make it like a history lesson in a sense, like to then educate the younger generation or have people looking up like, what is this? Why is it? Because they, they won't have any frame of reference. Like if you, if you remade a juice movie in 10 years, like these young kids don't know what the hell that movie is. They don't, they would have to go watch it, like go look it up and watch it again. And then it may not make sense to them because they don't know Tupac. (laughs) <laughs> they don't. They don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Exactly. So, so it's kind of like a um, the ones that can be redone right now are the ones I think where people can really appreciate. You can have fun with it. You can like we talked about Shaft, Foxy Brown, stuff like that. But I think some of the more seminal, like cultural classics or the cult classics and stuff like that that we grew up on and watched. I think you'll have to try to let a lot of time go by and people really miss those movies. Like, dang, it was, it's was it been 40 years, the 40th anniversary of Boys and Hood. Then... God, really? <sighs> you know, then you remake it and it's, like, special because it's more about acknowledging the history than making the film. Right. That makes sense. Right. No, it does. It, it makes total sense. Um, and even, even with Boys in the Hood itself, Boys in the Hood is now coming up on, I want to say, just shy of 25 years since, since, since it came out. And wow. and a movie like Boys in the Hood has such that cultural impact that's locked in, that's locked in that case. You know, it's in that case. And we watched the, uh, you know, for what we know, what we knew as the birth of. Uh, John Singleton as the filmmaker when he came from poetic justice and he went to higher learning and then he, he branched out to uh, uh, the uh, I'm sorry Too Fast Too Furious and he he branched out you know and, and, and he's one of those celebrated highly celebrated uh, filmmakers of our time that you, you wish he would have got he, he gets more recognition you know for example I hate down talking all lies on me the, the Tupac biopic that came out last year but I can't help but say I didn't like it I thought it was a horrible movie and when you have uh, somebody who was that close to the subject in Tupac that that could have gave you a film just as important as a straight out of Compton but then you're, you're left to kind of and, and this is no shot at Benny Boom Benny Boom was my guy but uh-huh. But when you have somebody who, who's had a personal relationship with the subject of your biopic, who can take that person's life and, and celebrate it, you know you're, you're not shy about it. You're gonna you're gonna explore all the the positive and negatives of this man's life. But you know for a fact that I have a certain relationship with this man to where I'm going to honor his legacy and I'm going to show his life on screen the way it, it was intended to be showed. Mm-hmm. So with that being said. And you know, of course, you know we're gonna have biopics regardless. But what bio, what biopic would you like to see done by who, about who, would you like to see? I would love to see a James Baldwin biopic. Nice. And I would love to see it. Starring. Well, let me backtrack director I would do it I would have a James Baldwin biopic directed by I want I want to say like I'm trying to I I would love to I'm trying to think of a more contemporary director who 
I feel like would really capture it. You know, I think um, what's the um, the um, Barry Jenkins who did Moonlight? Okay, I really I really liked what he created with Moonlight cinematically, like that that storytelling of Moonlight, seeing it through the three phases of his life mm -hmm. and how raw and authentic that was. So I would give Barry Jenkins a shot. I would, I would stay away from, um, you know, like some of the icons, you know, the John Singleton, people like that. But if Gary Gray is, I would give Barry Jenkins that shot. So a James Baldwin biopic directed by Barry Jenkins and I would want to see Donald Glover, either Donald Glover as James Baldwin, like a young, like a younger. Baldwin. Good choice. Good choice. Um, or um, I think um, him. I love Omar Epps, and I think Omar Epps would be a great, like, an older version. Mm -hmm. that make. So I love Donald Glover, uh, Omar Epps, and Omar Epps is, like, my favorite, one of my favorite actors. I love Omar Epps. But he's a legend um, at this point. You know, he's definitely, he's, he's put in his work, so he's definitely been around for quite some time. Um, yeah, so those that's what I would say. I want a James Baldwin biopic directed by Barry Jenkins, starring uh, Donald Glover, uh, Omar Epps, and um, yeah, yeah. I think I think that would be that'd be good. I personally, Which for me, I uh, I have two. Um, of course, you know, in my opinion, the best Huey P. Newton story. It's Panther by, by Mario Van Peebles. But if we were going to do a film... A, say again? I said that is a great movie. Oh, yeah. Awesome movie. Like, if there was going to be another Huey P. Newton story, I would love for Ava DuVernay to direct it. And perhaps Jacob Lattimore take on the role of Huey P. Newton. And the reason why I say him is because... Well, number one, Ava. Ava with Selma, you know, with what she had to work with, like she 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 couldn't get all the original uh, speeches uh, speeches of Dr. King, so she wrote a lot of them just off bat. So a lot of them aren't even real speeches, that, but they're they're tailor made to feel like real speeches. You know what I'm saying? So for that, I thought that was a hell of an accomplishment, and 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 how, and how she can frame certain things and the way she tells a story, I am. I would love to see what she can do with that particular, with that particular story. Plus, um, Thirteenth, the uh, documentary that she did on uh, on Netflix, her attention to detail is so vivid, and it's and it's a beautiful canvas that she that she paints. Um, as far as Jake, as far as uh, Jake Blattermore playing Huey P. Newton, he has he's he's a young actor who has a hundred percent won me over as as an actor. You know, he, he was a singer at one point, but. Seeing his work on The Shy, uh, seeing his work in uh, The Maze Runner, and he did the movie with with, uh, with Will Smith, uh, Collateral Beauty, not too long ago. This young brother is really rising as some might really look out for. He's a he's a hell of a talent. So for me, real quick, not to interject, and I would have I would have Lena write the James Baldwin script. I would have Lena Waithe write that. Oh yeah, definitely, because she does a hell of a job on the on The Shy. <laughs> Oh yeah, and she's just brilliant. Like, and she gets it. I know she knows his history, and she's the James Baldwin buff. But anyway, yeah, I agree. And because he's he's dope too. He's a really good actor. Yeah, like, he's a good actor. Absolutely. So we got uh, we got uh, two minutes left in the show. So let's take this time to uh, let's do some plugging. Uh, J sorry, like you calling you Jay Miss? Like we're at high school right now. Julian Mitchell, <laughs> Julian Mitchell, uh, what are you working on next, man? Like, let, let the people know what's what's the future uh, holding holding down for you. 
Yeah, man. So for me right now, uh, there's a couple of things. I have the live talks, Get Paid to Be Yourself, which I mentioned earlier. So I have two coming up for All-Star Weekend in L.A., February 16th and 17th, uh, one with Bondo Fresco, who I mentioned uh, at General Assembly. And then the other is with Lena Waithe, actually, on the 17th, uh, all in downtown L.A. for NBA All-Star Weekend, which is in L.A. Um, this year. I also am... Uh, rolling out my next installment of Corner Office, uh, the Corner Office series for Beats by Dre uh, that profiles different entrepreneurs, founders, you know, who have businesses that are moving culture. Uh, so previous ones are Rich Paul, um, John Seymour, Sweet Chick, yep. uh, Civil. So the next one's going to be really exciting. So we're working on putting that out now. Um, you can also check uh, the Art of Self-Made, um, which is a series that I have with uh, Bel Air as, as well. Um, so we've done like Khalid Ross, A Boogie with the Hoodie, Post Malone. Uh, now we have Steve Aoki and Dave East and some others um, on the way that we're working on. So it's a video and editorial series. Um, so that's coming. I also have IQ Labs, which is uh, my company. So it's one part. Uh, media education and partnerships so um, there'll be more about that um, public facing but that's kind of like the big picture um, and then I'll be in London uh, the next week to have a get paid to be a self live workshop with social fix so it'll be my first time in London um, you know just working with young creators and entrepreneurs in London um, to help them reimagine how to navigate creative industries you know so those are some of the things that I have coming up the series, um, going to London, doing the live talks for all star weekend. Dope, dope, dope. So let me go ahead and say it has been an absolute pleasure, man. Too much fun hanging out with, uh, hanging out with you, man. Thank you so much for, um, rocking with me today on this, on this episode, on this very special episode of back to the classes, my brother, man, I appreciate it. I'm glad we made it work. I'm Finally, proud of, proud of what you're doing, <laughs> with your podcast. Keep it up, man. Keep it up. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Let the good people know where they can find you, bro. Yeah, you can find me. Um, you can go to my website and see everything I'm working on. Uh, allthingsmitch.co. That's allthingsmitch.co. You can see news, content, updates, and everything. Then uh, social media, Twitter and Instagram, at allthingsmitch. Um, you can get you can hit me there. I'm usually um, pretty interactive. Yeah, and then LinkedIn. Um, I write a lot of posts and um, you know, do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. So it's Julian Mitchell or LinkedIn.com backslash uh Mr. Mitch. Nice, nice. You can find me on all the social medias simply at I am Jay Alonzo. That's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. Uh the Bassett Classic Facebook group is up and running. Just jump on uh Bassett Classics, a movie talk group on Facebook. And of course, we have uh much more stuff coming up coming your way. Don't forget to jump on to beatnetworkonline.com. We get all your links to other podcasts that we have, as well as all your merchandise and all of uh all the updated news clips that we have every day on Beat Network. With that being said, I am Jay Alonzo. Special guest, a special thank you to my guy, Julian Mitchell. It's been a good one. We'll see y'all next week. Peace.